Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. I have a special soft spot in my heart for New Zealand. Uh, in 2002, uh, thanks to Jacob Nielsen, actually, I was in Sydney, and my wife came along, and then we had our honeymoon here. And we said, boy, if we ever have kids, we're going to take them. And well, thank you to Optimal Workshop and UX New Zealand. Our kids are here, and they went swimming the last two days. They're so happy to be in the South Pacific. They've heard a lot about the South Pacific. I had a different picture of the South Pacific. It's a little warmer in my mind, but they've been swimming. And uh, anyway, we are just delighted to be here and to enjoy the hospitality of, of everyone we've been meeting. Um, I'm also just, I want to make a point right away, because this is so easy for us to forget, we who are benefiting from the wonderful work that people have done in putting together a conference like this. I've learned, especially firsthand in the last year, what a royal pain in the ass it is. How much work is involved? How many decisions need to get made? So I want to make sure we do a quick round of applause for Andrew and Matt and Alan and everyone who's involved here. <laughs> Truly stellar work. OK. so. I've been driving them crazy because I keep changing my talk. This is a new talk. And uh, I, I think I came up with a new title and description around 2 PM yesterday. And I think that was a little too late for the printers. Uh, but it's called What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And I'll just jump right in. Um, and I want to talk about your career, because I know you very well. I know your career. I know what's going on. I know what's very likely, at least, is that a lot of us have started our story of our careers in UX here, working on sites, working on apps, often at an agency, or maybe in-house at an organization that has some sort of UX or design team. Maybe for a little more adventurous, we're freelancers. And many of us, that's what we're going to do for a while. It's a very, very kind of steady path forward for the near term. You're going to be doing this type of work. You may be trafficking in wireframes, might be prototyping, you might be doing user journey flows. There's a lot of kind of basic stuff that we do. But it doesn't really diverge a whole lot early on. But after a while, if you've been in the field for well, maybe even five years, you start encountering uncertainty. Things start changing. And you, find, you might find you're working on things that are physical products, things that are services. No longer very micro level, but very macro. You might be designing teams and figuring out how to operate those teams and manage them. You might be designing organizations. Maybe you have a, your own startup, or you're figuring out how to create an organization within an organization. You might be working on that, that uh, hackneyed term, uh, building community. You might be building a business or a business model, even. You might be creating events. You might be writing or creating some other kind of content as a product. And suddenly, you're being asked to do things that you weren't anticipating. You're being asked to do things in context that you didn't expect to be in. So you may not any longer be at that agency that you started at and that you thought was the kind of work you were going to be doing. You may no longer be part of a team, but you may be managing that team or pushed upstairs into some other role. Or you might seek that out. But the, the truth is, we start moving from a place where things are known. It's interesting, it's exciting, but the map is pretty clear. And then, after a few years, we're in this kind of odd area with monsters and, and choppy waters and mystery. And most of all, uncertainty. So our careers in UX suddenly place us in odd places that we did not anticipate. And they're frightful at times. And no one really is telling us what to do. There are very few models for our careers. It, there's not an obvious map to help us move through these seas. And I can tell you as a publisher, it's about every other week I seem to get a proposal from someone who wants to write a book on UX management or UX leadership or product management from a UX perspective or all these sort of new areas. And I think it's really exciting. It means that the field is moving forward. But those books are going to take a long time to come out. Those maps, in effect, aren't here yet. And so we're kind of stuck. 
in a way with uncertainty. So I want to talk today a little bit about the uncertainty I faced and hopefully some of my stories as a guy who's been in the field for 25 years, who's been dealing with uncertainty, who's asked himself the question again and again, am I even a UX person anymore? That some of those stories might be instructive. And as I tell them, I'd like you to think about some of the questions I raise about what kind of work to, how do, well, well, how do we do our work? What does it mean to do UX in these different contexts? And start asking yourself them, because you may already be cracking these nuts. You may already figuring, you be figuring out what UX means in some new context. But if not, look at me as a mirror for your career in 10 years or 15 years, and you might be encountering some of these challenges down the road. Hopefully, I'll give you a little preview and a little bit of guidance to these stories about what to expect and what to do. So let me start with this. This guy, many of you recognize, I'm sure. It's Tim O'Reilly from O'Reilly Media. This guy is like my personal hero. Uh, I don't know where I would be without him because Getting to write a book and do work for O'Reilly was a huge part of, me, of my career. It really made my career in many ways. Um, about 12, 11 years ago, I got infected with an idea. And the idea was, you know, there's not enough UX books out there. We have a growing, growing community, but there's not a whole lot to support us. What are we going to do? How are we going to make that change? And I went around and talked to some traditional publishers like O'Reilly, and they were supportive in the sense of, yeah, if you want to work really hard and develop a book or two, we'll see if it has legs, and then we'll see if we can make a series out of it. And that seemed like a lot of hard work with a lot, without very much impact, without very much control, because ultimately the publisher would make most of the decisions. And that didn't sound very appealing to me. So um, I decided to start a company to do that. If I was going to work that hard, I might as well do it for myself. And I talked with Tim O'Reilly about this. And he said, yep, I've seen this path before. Most publishers are frustrated authors. And what frustrates authors, well, a bunch of things. We, we want to make more money. and We don't like why, that the publisher takes a big chunk. Or um, we want to have more uh, impact on the editorial aspects and the promotional aspects. But ultimately, what really drives people, certainly from the UX side, who are doing writing, is that we don't control the experience. We have very, very little control over the experience. And so um, I think it's really kind of cool when you find yourself in a position of trying to create stuff for this audience, very high standards, and wanting to have an impact on how that product is going to work for an audience like UX people. So I decided to do that. And I uh, didn't know anything about publishing. Uh, naivety can be your friend. It was certainly many times for me in my career. And um, the first question I encountered was this one. All right, I don't have any books out yet. Um, what should they work? How should they work? How should they be designed? How do you actually improve a product that you haven't created yet? So um, think about that question, because many of you are going to be, or already are, in that situation. You're starting from scratch. And I was able to uh, convince some kind, uh, trusting people like Donna Spencer to sign to write books for me without having answered questions like this, but I still had to deal with this. So if you're a UX person, how do you answer a question like this? Well, the good news is that a lot of the basic methods and approaches that we use are really good at answering really hard questions. In our case, what I started with was something that is really familiar to everyone, the idea of a show and tell session. Um, I got together with uh, a few groups of people who um, were basically our target audience, people who worked at agencies, people who worked at some in-house teams, and said, could I get together with you over a lunch sometime, brown bag type of thing, where you bring books, the books that mean something to you, that help you do your work, and um, pulled them together and just asked them some very basic questions. And I have some of those listed here. Why these books? What's good about them? What's not good about them? What are the features that you like and don't like? What about the content? What are the topics that are important to you? And um, where and when do you need this content? And this is about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. So it was basically a combination of competitive and generative research, because obviously books are out there. 
we have something to go on, maybe not our own, but other publishers have books that are appealing to UX people. So basic idea of a show and tell session and got a lot of really good lessons from that session or those sessions. So one is the answer to this question, where do we read? Remember, this is about 10 years ago. Things have changed since the iPad and Kindle have come out. But I'm not sure the context has changed all that much, the physical context. People told me again and again and again that we read our books on subways or on commutes, uh, or we just got assigned to go work with a client and we know we need to know something about method X, so we better darn well be ready by the time the plane lands to, to know something about method X. And so uh, a, a book is something that will be read on a plane trip, uh, on a commute, and then referred to as a reference thereafter. All right, well that's maybe obvious, but it has important implications. And for us, one of them was what shape, literally, should the book take? And um, we came up with the idea of a six by nine inch profile, and we knew that from talking to people in these sessions, short was really important. So 150 to 250 pages, and we've been pretty good about sticking in that range with some exceptions. So already, we're starting to drive our product design, uh, we're having it driven by basic UX work. And, you know, all right, I mean, someone who had been in the book industry for a long time might have been able to answer those questions, but you don't always have that person there. You don't always know who that expert out there is, but you do have what's up here. You do have those methods that you are used to using, that you're very familiar with, and often don't require a lot of time or effort to get up and running, like show and tell sessions. What else did we learn? Well, here's Donna's book. It's on card sorting. Uh, I remember, uh, God bless him, I love him, and I, I don't, this is not a diss, but I remember Jared Spool saying, a book on card sorting? And it's like, well, that's what people seem to want. At least this is what they wanted about 10 years ago. Very, very practical topic. Uh, we want to be able to do these methods well. We keep talking about these methods to our clients, for example, but how, what, what good is it if we're not expert with them? So going into depth into a topic like card sorting was really a good sign. It was a good signal to the community that we took that seriously. Okay. One of the other things we learned was you talk to people about the books they like, they bring a lot of their books, and often they had animals on the cover. Those books, uh, people often love, those are Riley animal books because of the animals. You know, our information architecture book is called the polar bear book. Okay, so covers mean a lot. Covers are talismans for these pieces of content. They're very symbolic, they have meaning. People make their own meaning out of the animals in many cases. And so we decided that it would be really smart to invest heavily, for, especially for a startup, in cover design. We, we spend roughly double what other publishers spend on covers, and maybe even a little more, because the covers give us huge returns in terms of people understanding what our brand is about and recognizing our brand. And so our covers were up to, I think we have, our, we have 23 books out now and a couple more in production, and they all have that same basic look, the same basic grid, the spine works the same, the back cover works the same. And then we get some benefits of reusing designs again and again and again, and yet those designs don't constrain the books. They don't constrain the products. By the way, um, one of the questions I asked uh, everyone was, so what's the, the one book that you have, that, that's the most critical book for your work? And remember, this is about 2005, 2006. Any guesses? Tufty, don't make me think. There you go. Donna nailed it. So um, it's interesting. You know, this was like by far the most popular book, and it may still be. It's still the best-selling book in the industry. It's in its third edition now. And uh, so what do you do? Well, you talk to Steve Krug. How'd you do it? Who's your designer? I'll hire them, and so forth. And so a lot of the DNA of Don't Make Me Think is in the Rosenfeld Media books now. So a takeaway. This is, a lot of these takeaways are gonna be pretty obvious, but that's because you're UX people, and we just need to be reminded of the fact that things like opinions are really valuable, and they're freely available. People will tell you passionately about anything. If you wanna interview people about pudding, 
you can probably get some really good ideas about pudding. There's nothing people don't have a passionate opinion about. Talk to this guy about the 77 Trans Am. There are just, there's an unlimited number of uh, uh, opportunities to get opinions that are actually have some value. I mean, you know, take them or leave them. They're there, but they give you something to react to. At their minimum, they are straw men for you to react to. OK, so great. Now we had an idea of a design. Now we actually had a book ready. And sorry, Donna, but Indy Young beat her to the punch. And her manuscript was ready. And we had to start thinking about, well, how do we test the design? Especially when the product is so expensive to produce. So how do you test a design of something that's really expensive? Well, again, something that's very obvious for us in UX. But we don't always do it in other areas with other types of products. You prototype. And so what we did is pretty straightforward. Uh, at this point, I was working with Liz Danzico, very well-respected design person who's now the first creative, of, uh, creative director of National Public Radio in the US. Uh, Liz and I basically decided um, it was a little weird to test books because books have been around for centuries. But you know what? That doesn't mean they are frozen and immutable and cannot change. In fact, if you look at the history of the book, the back of the book index and the table of contents didn't come out when Gutenberg first started printing books. Those were hundreds of years later from the initial book production. So we figured, all right, well, let's look at it from a UX perspective. Let's do a prototype. We did paper prototypes, actual paperbacks to use a print-on-demand service called Lulu to create. And, um, PDF testing. This is before Kindle and, and iPad. So we were working with PDF ebooks. Also pretty easy to test. And then we did some task analysis work. I was really focused on things like support for orientation. Do people, can people find their way around the book? Do they understand what it's about? Um, do they believe that this book is credible, that its publisher and author know what the hell they're doing? And uh, can they actually read it? Are, are the books readable? And this was really fascinating, you know, to actually test this object that had been, had been around for so long. And we don't know, and certainly haven't really been able to find a lot of information about usability testing done on a traditional product like a book. So um, what do we learn? Uh, for one, uh, the front part of the book is really, really important. The front matter matters. So the stuff. That's where the table of contents is and the introduction, the stuff before the meat of the book. And uh, people really relied on the front of the book to figure out what's in the book and how to find their way around and orient themselves to the content. And so we did something you know, pretty sort of silly, but I think it works, uh, called an FAQ. We have an FAQ for our books. They come before the table of contents. And the FAQ actually orients people to the content by answering some basic questions and then navigates people by giving them links to where they could find more information for each question. So it actually gives you a form of access to the content. Do you see what I'm doing here? This is IA, right? Just another form of IA. And another thing we learned is the back cover, not so important. The back cover has things like a blurb and testimonials you know, a bunch of other stuff, and, and people don't really look at it. It's not that important. It's almost like more important for the ego of the publisher and the author to have all these nice testimonials and so forth. So I mean, we still have those, but we just didn't worry so much about the back cover as much as we initially thought we would have to in terms of the design. So where does this take us? In 2008, we put out our first book. It's Indy Young's Mental Models. It has a certain look both to the cover and to the interior. 2015, our most recent book, also by Indy Young, uh, A Practical Empathy. And if you look at them, you'll see that especially the interior is the same. It's different, but it's the same. It bends, but it never broke. So every book has needs. Every author has certain types of content they want to communicate. And we've been able to address those things. And every once in a while, we learn something from a particular book and a particular author that we then work into our design. It's like the Borg. Uh, and um, we throw some things out, too. But if you look at these books, and you didn't know the dates that they'd come out, they look pretty much the same. And you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell that one was much older than the other. So 
This is kind of a big design win where UX comes in and says, wow, we can actually invest heavily in design in, ter in, terms, of, in terms of the experience, both on the opening the book, looking at the front matter, the cover, and then how the, the interiors actually work and have it work the same again and again and again, the same enough. So 23 titles, and we're pretty much using the same approach. That's a big investment but up front, but it pays great returns every time you put a new title out. And isn't that kind of what we're supposed to be doing? It's conceiving of design up front, and then you know, benefiting from that early investment. So takeaway, obviously, we are in an era where it's so, it's, there's almost no excuse not to prototype. We benefited from a print-on-demand service like Lulu being around in 2006, 2007, when we did our testing. There's only, only, only more now. And this is no mystery that things like 3D printing are really on our minds a lot. And this is, uh, I find this really interesting, the screen. This is uh, the top selling 3D printer at Amazon right now. And if you look at it, the title is very unconsumer. It's the, the FlashForge 3D printer, Creator Pro, metal frame structure, acrylic covers, optimized build platform, dual extruder W2 spools, works with ABS and PLA. PLA. But you know, what's really interesting is that it's $1,200. That's not a lot of money. Certainly not a lot of money for a design firm. And uh, how many questions? 189 have already been asked and answered, and 347 customer reviews. That's not insignificant. That feels very consumer to me. So this is on the verge of being a consumer product. And if that's true, and we're not thinking seriously about using technologies like this, then we've got a problem. So you can pretty much prototype anything these days. Uh, it's not always easy, but it's almost, uh, it's almost impossible to consider not doing so. OK. So all right, so now we have a book out. And we have a bunch of book out, books out. Uh, we don't want to just finish there. We're not done. We want things to keep changing. Um, how do we? innovating or at least improving, tweaking, and tuning product design over time. How do you do it? When you have a product that you're responsible for, whether it's digital and traditional or, or something a little different, what methods do you use? There's so many. And the one that I find that we've found the most benefit from is actually having um, a mobile user research platform. A mobile user research platform? That sounds really serious. That sounds really expensive. Well, what does it look like? It looks like this. <laughs> this is it. This is the UX bookmobile. And some of you have been at conferences where we've trudged the UX bookmobile out. I'm sorry we couldn't do it here, but I can't afford to bring my staff all the way from New York to Wellington yet. Um, but uh, what do we do? Uh, we, we decided, you know, one of the worst experiences any conference goer can have is to work a booth. Sorry. I'm sure someone here may be working a booth. Um, it's difficult. If you've ever worked a booth, you sit there and you hope someone comes by and that you can actually engage in a conversation, and it's so artificial. And we also wanted to sell books at conferences, so why not take the books to the people? Why not camp outside an author's talk with a cart like this, ready with Square to take money? And so it's certainly a, a, a sales platform. It's an alternative to a booth, but it's much more important than that. Because this little cart, which, by the way, costs us $160 US, it's so cheap that it's almost disposable. We leave it behind at a lot of conferences. Is, this is actually mana for introverts. Do we have any introverts in the room? No, you're not going to raise your hand, right? <laughs> so the introverts at a conference, no, you, those of you who are here who may be introverted know how painful this place is, as lovely as this place is, and as wonderful as people are here, it doesn't matter if you're really introverted. You're just looking for something to keep you away from people for at least some of the time. What's really nice? Oh, look over there. There's some books. I can walk over to those books and take a look at them. And they don't talk back. They don't stare at me funny. They don't make stupid conversation. And I interact with them. And while I'm doing that, Lou and Karen and Elaine, whoever else in Roosevelt Media is looking at me in a not creepy way, we hope, and trying to learn a little bit about, huh, 
you know, which one did she pick up and why? Did her eyebrow go up at a certain point? Maybe that's an in for me to come over and say, oh, that's our best-selling book. Did you know that? Uh, is that, you know, do you, have you seen it before? You know, the author's actually giving you a talk tomorrow you might really enjoy. Um, and then that they open up. And it's really nice because they often keep looking at the book while they're talking to us. They're not making eye contact. Um, and it's not just extrovert, introverts, obviously, it's extroverts as well. But they are looking at these books and then telling us what they think about these books. Oh, you know, this one was really hard to read. I'm 45 years old now. My, eye, my, my vision is going down the toilet. Can you do something about that? Yeah, yeah we actually we can. Or um, you really need to get so-and-so to write the follow-up to that title. We need another one on content strategy that does blah, blah, blah. Fantastic. Can you introduce us? And so forth. So we learn so much simply by having conversations or even non-conversations, just limited observations that go around this bookmobile. One of the nice things about the idea of a bookmobile and many other ideas that we UX people can take advantage of is we have this power to close the gap between people and products and organizations. We're really good at looking to close that distance. We are the people, for example, who can probably make the best argument to our CEOs that they should spend an hour a week doing customer support. We are the people who can explain those types of things or do them ourselves. We have so many methods, it's almost unlimited what we can do. So always be closing the gap between people and products and, and your organization. Okay. So um, I've just talked a lot about books as a traditional product. It's a physical product, uh, ones that have been around for centuries, yet they're ripe for UX people to work with. And they, you can challenge assumptions. Just because it's been around for a long time doesn't mean it can't be better. What else can you do that with? I'm not even sure that question is really that important because you will. You will find yourself in situations where you may be working with things that are not digital, things that may have been around a long time. And you're going to find that what you already know is a great signpost for moving forward through uncertainty. But I want to give you some more examples. And these examples have to do with UX conferences. You know, look, at, look around, and this is just like fantastic here. This is like this beautiful thing that the folks behind UX New Zealand have put together for us. It's, a, it's like incredibly generous. And uh, it's hard, as we talked about. And, but then you look around, and I'm looking past you guys. I can't see your faces, really, but I can see that there's a harbor out there with ships. Uh, I'm, I'm almost tempted to daydream a little bit. Might not be a good idea up here. Uh, but there's just so much beauty here. To do this in a museum, this is so thoughtful in so many ways. And there's so many options. So I was just at another conference that blew my socks off last month in a little place called Kitchener in Ontario. Kitchener. Well, I don't know how many people there are, but it's like, uh, Kitchener? I'm, you know, you, you hear about all these big cities where there's big events, and then just Kitchener, Ontario. And the conference is called Fluxible. And Fluxible is just like 150 people and attending. And there's like tons of live music. They had probably like eight or 10 live acts playing music between break, during breaks and, and so forth. Um, they, had, they had love. In fact, there's Steve Portugal on the right there getting some love from a perfect stranger. Um, and uh, he seems pretty, he's still here. He's here actually right now and he's still standing. So everything's okay. Um, there was goats. There's a, there's a lot going on. It's also kind of, it's a, bit, it's a bit scary in a way, like all these great events, like UX New Zealand, Flexible, and on and on and on. And they're just better and better and better, and they're setting the bar higher and higher. And it's like, well, how many conferences do we need? So I'm going to give you another quote. This is from me. Does that look like me? I'm wearing the same shirt, even. Um, I thought we had reached peak UX conference a couple years ago, but then I got infected again. The infection this time wasn't like books, but this time it was about doing a conference. Here I was like, this is too many. They're great. We don't need more. And then people uh, on the UX team at a company called Rackspace, 
which is a big cloud service provider in Texas, approached me and said, look, we are a UX team in a large enterprise, and we're a, we're a company that serves other large enterprises. And UX is like this really a critical aspect to what we do. And yet, there's no kind of there there. There's no conference really to address this. Would you guys at Rosenfeld Media consider putting on a conference? We'll help you out. We'll be your partner. Next year, 2014, I'm eating my words, and I'm announcing this new conference called Enterprise UX. And it happened last May. So now we've got some new challenges, right? It's like this thing. Conferences have been around for a long time. All we had to work with was the sort of fragmented conversations about enterprise UX that were happening all around. You know, in person where we couldn't hear them and, and through social media where we occasionally could. And uh, it felt like the right idea, um, but we had to do some work. And the first type of work we had to do was to answer this question. How do you design a product, let's say a conference in this case, around a conversation? I have a feeling a lot of you actually are doing this without necessarily realizing it, that the conversation is sort of the stuff of your product, ultimately. I mean, certainly if you're doing any kind of work at a social media firm, uh, this is the case. So how do you design an, a product around conversation? I'll tell you what we did. This is just one way to do it. Um, but you probably have some other ideas uh, that might be really useful. Um, we knew that there was a sort of cloud of conversation going on about enterprise UX. Uh, it could be people were talking about how to do UX within an enterprise context, like they might be running the corporate portal, for example. We also knew that other people were talking about how to provide services, like software services, to enterprises that had good experiences. So enterprise UX in the enterprise, UX for the enterprise, we didn't really know which of those was more important at this point. And there was certainly some overlap. But the conversation was sort of cloudy and uh, a little bit nebulous and certainly very distributed. But it was there. And so the first step we had was to basically channel it and capture it in places that we could analyze it. So doing stupid things like getting the conversation going on your own Facebook feed, that's something that actually was pretty useful for us. Uh, Tweeting questions out, identifying people who had ideas about the topic, and then following up with them by email and taking their answers and looking at those. Um, doing things like uh, having discussions on private lists where we knew people who did enterprise UX related stuff or were working with enterprises might be hanging out. And we channeled all those stuff, all, the, all that conversation as best we could into basically one big document. And then we analyzed the crap out of it just basic content analysis. And we combed through it and found patterns. So again, you see what I'm doing here. This is, in my case, you know, IA work. You may be taking a very different approach as you try to understand a conversation that's going on out there. But for me, this was a very much an IA approach. Uh, we came up with four themes. Insight uh, at scale, that's basically how to do user research in the enterprise context. Uh, craft amid complexity where you're talking about design, but we're talking more about designing systems rather than designing products. Uh, enterprise experimentation, how we can take a lean approach to, to figuring out what works and what doesn't in an enterprise setting, which is big and not necessarily lean friendly. And then finally, uh, how to change corporate culture so that it may be more design friendly, as well as how to change yourself so you fit more within that corporate culture. So then the next step, after identifying those four themes, was to sequence them. So we have four themes now that are the backbone of a conference, this product in effect. And if you look at the uh, main page of the site that we came up with, we sequence them from tactical to strategic. So those four themes I just ran through, when we did them at the conference, we started with what felt more nuts and bolts, like let, let's start with research, because that's often where we start, and move to, to design, experimentation, and then to culture. And so there's a nice logical sequence that actually told the story about the subject in many respects. Great, OK. So we have that. Uh, and I like to think that this is the obvious one. And yes, there is a, a, a new book out, fourth edition. Uh, but I want you to think about how you might get at taking a whack and analyzing and understanding a distributed conversation 
using your own methods. Maybe you're doing a more of a, an analytical approach, uh, maybe a more of a statistical approach of analyzing a uh, conversation that's going on in digital formats. Maybe you might take more of a, uh, an ethnographic approach and have those conversations, be part of those conversations or put yourself in a place where you might observe them. So then what? So we already have like the backbone of what we wanted to do for this product. Well, how do you broaden it? It's not just like us, us being myself and my, my two cohorts as, as the program committee, that's Dave Maloof and Uday Gajandar. It's like, we don't want to just own this thing ourselves. If it's just like this sort of cabal, who's going to want to be part of the conversation if we pretend to own it? So how do you broaden and engage more and more people in this conversation that's the basis of your product? Well, our approach was to take each theme of the four, uh, find three interesting speakers to be participate in that theme, uh, a balanced group of speakers, and then uh, combine them with a really smart theme leader. In this case, for Insight uh, at Scale, we used Mr. Portugal, who did a wonderful job of facilitating a conversation, conversation again, that took place months in advance of the conference with the speakers on his theme. So basically, each theme becomes a mini conference with three speakers and a facilitator. But more importantly, uh, that conference conversation starts way in advance. And they get to iterate and hear from each other, learn from each other, react to each other's draft presentations, and adjust accordingly. So um, we did four of those, obviously. And if you put this together and start designing a program, so it's a, in our case, like here, a two-day main program, conference program. Kind of pretty typical, opening and closing keynotes, sandwiching these four mini conferences, these four themes. And if you look at it, well, all right, um, the program committee figured a lot of this out, but we also managed to engage people like Steve and other theme leaders in the content and give them a role and give them some ownership. And boy, that's really hard because especially with the first event, you gotta trust people. You gotta hope they're gonna come through on their promises because if they don't, what, are you gonna sue them? <laughs> You're stuck. Okay, so we also wanted to broaden it a bit more. What other opportunities were there to engage more people in this product, a conference program? Uh, we actually had a guy named Dan Willis, who some of you know. He's just a great, great facilitator and a coach of speakers. He works with Adam Polanski a bit, another great coach. And Dan um, said, we're going to do something like Pecha Kucha, but it's, it's actually going to be eight five-minute stories, enterprise UX stories. Bang, 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 five minutes each. Uh, we're going to have people apply to have their stories told, and I'll select eight, and then I'll prep them. And I'll sequence them just right. And that's what he did. So now we've got Dan having a role in broadening this program and having some role in, in uh, extending the real estate. And then he extended it in turn to eight people that he trusted. So now you've got um, essentially, uh, if you look at this, this is like a big chunk of real estate. And you're not zoning it all the same way. You're zoning it in some interesting ways that support people being involved. The takeaway here is really that when you design for engagement, you have to be willing to let go. You have to be willing to give up some control. Um, I like this picture, by the way. I don't know who's walking whom, really, because I know whenever I walk a dog, I kind of feel like it's the other way around. But there's an interesting uh, formula of control here that you have to be conscious of with any product design. You have to give away some control. And you know, it's not only to the users, but there's different kinds of users, especially with more complex products. There's different classes or roles that we have to be willing to let go of to some degree and let them own what we've created, and in fact, let them become creators. OK. So get a little further in developing this conference program as a product. We've got our four themes. We've got a bunch of different people involved. But you know what's really hard about a conference is well, it's an experience, and it takes a lot of energy. I'm probably already tiring some of you guys out. And this is just the first talk. We've got we to be here until 
5 p.m. roughly. So many conferences, what they do is at the end of the first of the two days, they have a big party. And you're tired. So here's the arc. Here's the, the typical kind of hero's story arc. And I, I grabbed this diagram. It's done by Ava Lotta Lamb, who's this fantastic illustrator and sketch noter. And we're using her to illustrate many of our books these days. And this comes right from our next, one of our next books, uh, Story Mapping by Donna Leachaw. It's been really influential for me to think of experiences, as Donna suggests, as following a story arc with a climax and a denouement, all those types of things. And what, you know, she says, what can't we do this with? Can we do this with a transactional flow? Can we, pretty much anything. Well, all right, can we do this with a conference experience? So you're the conference organizer. You know that people are, are going to want to go to a party at some point. They need energy to get there. But as you get toward the end of the day, the arc actually drops off, and they run out of steam, because you've been doing a lot of the same things, people sitting in talks, hearing speakers all day long. That's really hard on people. At the end of one day of that, you're often exhausted. And then you're going to send people to a party exhausted. And what are they going to feel about your conference when they're exhausted and seeing each other, all of their colleagues exhausted? They're not going to be saying a whole lot of good things. They may be OK with it, but you really want to send them in on a high. And what we did was we made sure that those storytelling sessions, which were full of passion, of energy, there were people telling their stories in tears, there were people getting rounds of applause, and we put it at the very end of the first day to close that gap between the conference and the party, and to actually um, almost create a second arc. So you thought it was dropping off, and then you got jazzed up again. And one of the ways we jazzed people up was with beer. And I thought about doing that this morning. And I know we're down under, and that's OK, but I'm sorry. I just couldn't bring myself to, to do it. Um, so just right at the beginning of these storytelling sessions, uh, the other organizers, Dave and Uday, and I burst out with those uh, beer trays that hang from your, your, your neck, and with popcorn as well and just started going down like vendors at a stadium and handing out beer and popcorn. We, got the, uh, we gave beer to the presenters, kind of gave them a little bit of breathing room to see that we were kind of making things a bit raucous. It made them a little more comfortable. They didn't have to drink the beer. Uh, but they felt better. We handed it out to the speakers. It was a lot of fun. And again, what it did was it sort of created this uh, <laughs> second climax um, and got people to the party jazzed up excited. And they told each other how excited they were by that first day. And it kind of solved this design problem of what do you, you've just spent $40,000 on a party and no one's happy. <laughs> no one's energized. Instead, the buzz was compounding. It built on itself and people were excited. Fantastic. Great, great experience. So one takeaway, obviously, is the light. We hear a lot about using the light. But I want you to think about using time as a design material. And um, I'm not trying to shill Donna's book, because I've, you know, I haven't even read the whole thing yet. It's still in, under, in development. It's getting close to production. But I've seen enough of it that I'm really excited by this idea of using this story arc as a backbone for experiences, for tying together designed moments in ways that compound, in ways that are greater than those individual pieces of design. And it can, you can do this with things that you may not expect, like a conference program. Donna talks a lot about Breaking Bad. And it's just you know, an, an example of how there's so much out there from other fields that informs us about things that can be really useful for what we do as practitioners. I mean, if you've watched a series like Breaking Bad, that story arc is very clearly the driver, both within each individual episode and across five seasons. And think about sustaining energy and viewership, which actually grew for that particular show over five seasons. That's a long time. It's a very long time. And they probably could have kept going. OK. One more question. 
how do you design things around a conversation that probably doesn't exist? Maybe it, you think it will, but it's not there yet. Um, what am I talking about here in our case is we keep, and maybe you do too, hearing about product management. I mean, so much that I'm finding our editorial agenda for future books is, is as much about product management as about UX. And that's because UX has kind of been, many of us at least, are moving in that direction. It's a natural path, some might say, and some might say it's actually not a natural path. There's a lot of disagreement. And then there's product management itself as a thing where the, there's not a clear there there. And uh, it's, you know, if you do product management at um, a traditional company, like uh, back in the States, I'm thinking of Procter & Gamble, or maybe more relevant might be a, a multinational like uh, Nestle. That's very different than if you do it at a tech company uh, that's primarily digital. So the definitions of things like product management are very fluid. It's not really clear what the there is there. And we know that UX is thinking about it, and we know that Project managers are often looking to UX as a sort of secret sauce type of thing that helps them avoid getting caught up in launching features and instead helps them align their products to deliver good experiences. All right, so something's going on. It seems like a conversation ought to happen. How do we make it happen? Well, this is a really simple approach that we're using. We put on um, a couple of one-day virtual conferences a year and actually, this one will be produced by UIE, Jared Spool's company, that, that does such a good job with virtual seminars. And we gave this event, which is actually launched. We just launched it. I don't think we've even publicized it yet. Um, a really broad framing. It is the Product Management and User Experience Conference. <laughs> Can you give it a broader framing than that? I don't think so. And if you read the description, it's basically saying what I just said. Product Management, User Experience, they seem to be intersecting more and more. Let's have an event about it. That's it. Do you want to come? Maybe. Maybe you're not sure. But uh, part of it depends on who you are. And so we have actually are trying to appeal to two primary audiences. One is user experience people, and the other is product managers. And we have personas that are driving how we design the experience of the event for these two audiences. The other thing we're doing is we just picked a bunch of speakers that we think are really smart, some from product management and some from user experience, and know that they all have something to say about the intersection. But what we don't yet know, and if you went to the site, you'd see this is what they're going to say. We have no list of talks, no schedule, no list of presentations. We just have a broad framing and a speaker lineup. What are we going to do? We're basically surveying people who come to the site, whether they register or just visit the site, and asking them what basically they want to hear. We're getting a list of topics from the speakers, and we're having people vote on those topics. So this is a basic UX method. It's lean user research, which makes sense given the event. We're really eating our own dog food. And it's a survey. And we're going to take what we learn and present the results back to the speakers so that they know what attendees might want to learn at this conference in February. It's a pretty simple approach. Um, and one of the really interesting things that you find is that user experience research starts to be a really fantastic promotional approach. We like to think that these influential speakers are going to say, hey, that's really a good, smart way to do things. Um, but more importantly, we like to think that people we're appealing to, our, our audiences, are going to also appreciate that there are other ways to figure out who should be speaking about what. And it's basically to use the methods that we all use. So if you are trying to basically figure out what's going on out there, what's the conversation, and when you're not even sure if it's happening and where it might exist, can you put something out there, in effect, kind of a prototype of a conference, and find out about it through things like survey research? OK. So, those are my stories. Um, I want to give you one last takeaway to consider, and that is that um, as we find ourselves in all these non-traditional contexts, whether we're doing event planning or, or learning uh, from publishers or wherever you might be working, that those people have a lot to tell us. 
You know who knows a lot about user experience? Event planners. Certainly, I like to think some publishers do. Uh, pretty much any area, any traditional industry has something that they don't necessarily call user experience methods and, and thinking that you can tap and learn from. And that'll help you because you're starting with the generic approach. And then as you move into those fields, uh, it can be really, really beneficial to augment what you already know with what they're doing in those fields. So in effect, we're kind of like taking each other's medications. I think it's fun. They look like they're having fun. What can we learn from each other? So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You do UX. That's it. That's really it. You guys, whether you're doing it now, whether you will be doing it uh, willingly or not, you're going to be in contexts that are not what you expect. You're going to be working on things that you didn't expect things that you, you never thought UX could happen with. And yet it will. And when you're in those uncharted seas, when you're not really sure what to do, you UX it. You UX the hell out of it. You already know that. That's your map forward through uncertainty. And that's my talk. Thank you.